need to be giving them ATACMs and other long range precise strike capability. And more importantly than giving them the weapons is then giving them the policy pronouncement that they can fire at Russian military targets wherever they find them. Hello and welcome to The Frontline with Lucy Fisher on Times Radio. I'm delighted today to be joined by General Philip Breedlove. A former Supreme Allied Commander, Europe of NATO, General Breedlove is a retired four-star general in the United States Air Force and was previously Commander of US Air Forces in Europe and in Africa. With such a wealth of experience, we are so lucky to get his insights today on some of the latest developments in Ukraine. So, General Breedlove, welcome. Thanks for having me, Lucy. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. So the major development uh, today in Ukraine, of course, has been uh, uh, Vladimir Putin ordering a 36-hour ceasefire to coincide with Russian Orthodox Christmas. Very rarely can we take anything Moscow does at face value. What's your take on what's going on here? Is this in earnest? Is it a classic attempt at misdirection? Or is Putin up to something else? Well, I hate to start off on a negative note, but we have to remember this is a man who generated a war to meet his view of the world. He organizes army, crossed an internationally recognized border, and invaded a neighbor. And uh, to close the thought out, he is the guy whose forces at his directions have weaponized rape, weaponized torture, weaponized murder and weaponized the criminal kidnapping of Ukrainian uh, children to repopulate uh, the Slavic race in Russia. So with all of that as a background, I think we have to have a bit of a jaundiced view of exactly what Mr. Putin is trying to do. My guess is it's the latter of what you offered. He's trying to change Uh, the story, change what is out there about what he's doing in uh, Ukraine. And remember, in the last couple of days, he suffered this incredible loss of their soldiers who were using bad tradecraft and got targeted because of their bad tradecraft. And I think Mr. Putin is just desperate to try to change the narrative away from the problems of this this criminal enterprise that he's launched upon. Interesting. And where do you think that attempt to change the narrative might have most purchase? Will it work with the domestic audience in Russia? Will it work in other parts of the world, possibly not the West, but in Africa, in Asia? It will work among those nations that are desperate to keep Russia close as an ally. And he has very, very few of those. Those nations will absolutely accept anything that Mr. Putin says. There are elements of his own nation that will absolutely accept anything Mr. Putin says. But I think that inside of his nation, the voices and the people who take everything Mr. Putin says at face value, they're diminishing. And clearly in the West, you see that Uh, Western leaders and nations are now taking everything they do with a more jaundice eye. Very proud of some of the words that Macron said recently about how we need to approach uh, Mr. Putin and Russia in the future. And so it's important to see that clear and keen and important Western allies are seeing through uh, these smoke screens that Mr. Putin tries to put out. Well, I certainly want to come on to um, Emmanuel Macron's latest uh, interventions uh, in this. But just to finish on on this ceasefire, it's striking that it's come just after the Turkish president Erdogan has called on Putin to effect a unilateral ceasefire to enable negotiations. Do we think that that's had any part in his decision or is that just a coincidence? Uh, I think I would be guessing if I offered an opinion here. I think that Uh, uh, It's important that Mr. Erdogan is making some overtures. It's important that Mr. Erdogan is is trying to signal to Russia that they've got to do something different than they're doing now. I think uh, leaders of the West showing displeasure with, again, this criminal enterprise that Mr. Putin is on is important. 
But I really don't think that Mr. Putin listens much to anybody except for them, himself. And I think he's really worried about his internal narrative now and, and this blunder and this wanton loss of life, of Russian life, uh, I think has affected him. Yes, this deadly uh, New Year attack that Ukraine um, uh, pursued uh, on this Russian base in, in the Donbass has reportedly led to hundreds of Russian soldiers being killed. So you say that has weakened Putin's position. Does that make him more dangerous, um, either to Ukraine or to the West, in terms of how he might retaliate? What could we expect from him next after this sort of ceasefire gambit? So I'm more focused on other things that are happening. Some of the leaders in nations that were formerly or he believes are still in his orbit are starting to question Russian actions. And I think that's what he fears more than anything else, losing his internal support, both internal to his people, but also internal to those few nations who have been on board. As that starts to crumble and as we start to see Prigozhin and others take more leadership and be more insistent on what happens with their forces that are involved, uh, Wagner Group and others, these sort of cracks in his ultimate control, I think, are far more uh, concerning to him than maybe, and I'm not belittling what you just said, but I just think those are the things that I'm following more than some of these uh, sort of pronunciations in the, in the public domain. domain. And so, so let's talk about France then and, and Macron's uh, latest uh, remarks and agreement to send light tanks to Ukraine. And we shouldn't um, undermine the contribution of materiel that France um, has made. They've sent um, howitzers, they've sent um, uh, air defence um, systems, but it has been um, somewhat limited what France has contributed. And that has been read as Macron wanting to toe the line, trying to keep the dialogue going with Putin. So with these light tanks going, I've got two questions. Firstly, how significant um, a, a contribution might that make to Ukraine on the battlefield? And second, politically, does this mark a major shift in France's position on, on Ukraine and their long-term commitment to Kyiv? Well, I'm going to answer two similar questions because I really wanted to make these remarks, and I'm glad you you called uh, called on these questions. I think it's important what France has done because it sort of breaks a policy barrier that we've had out there. The West, and in, and specifically the United States, has been largely completely deterred from sending these these kinds of weapons that could be seen possibly as in some tiny way offensive. We keep wanting to label everything we're doing defensive because we, we, are, we are deterred because we believe we're going to provoke Russia. Oh, by the way, Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia is killing Ukrainian civilians. Russia is, de is destroying Ukraine's civilian infrastructure. When are we going to be provoked, I think is a good question. But in a policy sense, it's really important what France has done. A Western nation has stepped up now to say we are going to send these armored vehicles, lightly armored vehicles, as you correctly point out, but we're going to start sending these armored type uh, vehicles with these great uh, tank killing ca capabilities forward. I had hoped my nation would lead that uh, charge in the policy sphere. And now it looks that France has stepped out. And that's the important part. To your second question, breaking this log jam and saying that we're going to give these more capable uh, abilities and weapons types to Ukraine in order to press the fight with Russia. It's very important, and I'm happy that France has stepped forward to the task. That's fascinating. And do you think that this might lead to um, an evolution of the risk calculation in terms of the West um, saying it is legitimate for Ukraine to use Western donated weapons to hit Russian forces or, or other targets in Russia? I do, and this is important. Um, we have de facto, we the West have de facto created sanctuary for Russia. We literally say it almost to assure them in public that we're limiting Ukraine 
so that they cannot use our weapons to fire into Russia. But remember that Russia is firing into Ukraine from almost 300 degrees on the globe, from the west-northwest parts of Belarus all the way around to the western-northwestern parts of the Black Sea. Russia is firing from all of those directions in the Ukraine, and, and we're telling Ukraine they cannot return fire into Russia. As a military man, this is is uh, is absurd, and I think that this uh, uh, Putin has come to expect and has taken advantage of this sanctuary that we've given him. This buildup now that we're watching of forces in Belarus; these are legitimate targets. Here's what I believe: We have asked Ukraine to have discipline with the weapons that we have supplied them. They have done a wonderful job of observing our limitations and being disciplined in their attack. We should take that trust that they have shown and we should allow them to use all weapons to strike Russian forces, Russian supply chains, and Russian advances and troop concentrations, no matter where they are when they're aimed at Ukraine. Sanctuary is an extremely hard thing to fight through, especially when we're guaranteeing that sanctuary for Russia. Well, you make your uh, views on that matter very clear um, and elo eloquently expounded there. Do you think that the sentiment in Washington, in other capitals across Europe, are changing to fall into line with that? Or do you think we're still some way away of seeing the West pivot to that kind of approach? Well, what we're seeing is Ukraine developing its own indigenous capabilities, and we're seeing discipline in the shots that Ukraine is making into Russia with their indigenous capabilities. They are hitting uniquely important military targets. And so my hope is that that, again, the trust they've shown with our weapons so far, the discipline that they've shown with their indigenous weaponry, will uh, then start to break the logjam. And although it's not tied completely, I think this move by France to, to give more capable weapons to, uh, to Ukraine is possibly, and I would say hopefully, that first small step towards changing these policy paradigms that guarantee Russia sanctuary. There's also a lot of uh, concern about this sort of falling into a state of being a frozen conflict. Do you think we are approaching stalemate or do you think that that's um, less of a concern than is sort of speculated by some? I think that's exactly what Mr. Putin wants us to think. Mr. Putin wants to separate Ukraine from its supporters. And the very first way he can do that is say that I'm going to be fighting for years. Are you willing to pay for that? He wants to separate the people of the West from the governments of the West in their commitment to Ukraine. And his best weapon is this first cold winter where he's making life miserable for a lot of Europeans, even more than just Ukraine. And he's trying to drive that wedge between the electorate and the elected in our Western governments. And so we have to recognize that this is probably Mr. Putin's most effective tool. His army is failing him. And if we give Ukraine what it needs, Ukraine will defeat in detail this army. Uh, so Mr. Putin has to win the war in other ways. And I think the number one way is to drive this wedge between, between the people of the West and the leaders of the West by making them think about a long, costly, bloody war and you should give it up and allow Russia to overrun Ukraine. And are there particular countries where you're concerned that that narrative is catching on? My Let's country. Germany, Italy? My country, first. I think yeah. it's really important that the United States and the United States Congress continues to show solidarity with Ukraine because that will help other nations like the ones you just mentioned that will help them to also stay the course in the right thing to do, which is what we're doing. And so I think the, that the most important battleground may be 
right here in the U.S. Congress. How significant was Vladimir Zelensky's trip to Washington, D.C. last month? You know, we saw Joe Biden wearing that yellow and blue striped tie. The Ukraine battle flag unfurled on the floor of the House. Has that done much to sort of boost morale among politicians who've been wavering on support for Kyiv? Um, so I think the trip was very important. Um, and honestly, the, the, it, uh, I, I try to remain apolitical, so I'm going to get off this subject very quickly, <laughs> but I, I really don't think that the opposition to support for Ukraine in our Congress is about geopolitical or strategic military things. It's about internal American politics. And so I'll just leave it there because right now I enjoy a voice to both sides of the bench here in the United States, and I don't want to lose that. But I think it's all about politics as opposed to geostrategic reasoning, what's going on in our Congress. Understood. Just to bring you back to the more sort of military side of, of the U.S.'s contribution to Ukraine then, obviously a big move for the Patriot air defense missiles to be supplied to Ukraine. Are there any particular other systems you'd like to see the U.S. hand over? Well, first of all, let's talk just a little bit about the Patriot. Uh, we're sending uh, one battery. And uh, the Patriot is a magnificent capability and a very uh, capable system uh, in doing what it is tasked to do. But it is a point defense system. And one, if you look at the size, I can't make my hands wide enough on your screen. If you look at the size of Ukraine and the little tiny part that a patriot will defend, this is important that we're doing it, but it's not going to be a large uh, capability. But it, much like what France has just done with this light tank, the patriot, I hope, will do for the rest of NATO and the West and even some of our non-NATO partners in supplying more capable and more numbers of high-end air defense. So I think while it is important what the Patriot will do on the battlefield for one target, for one thing that it can protect, because it is a point defense capability, more importantly is I hope it, in American terms, we say primes the pump to start the flow of other high-end capabilities from nations around the West. Understood. Well, I think uh, you may be onto something, us being on a precipice as, as the West are giving more. I note reports coming out of Germany about considerations being made for the MARDA infantry fighting vehicles being given to Ukraine. That would feel like a pretty significant move if if, uh, if Berlin goes for that. Just looking at what um, Volodymyr Zelensky has said uh, in recent days about Ukrainian intelligence uh, identifying uh, that Russia is planning a long term campaign uh, of drone attacks against Ukraine. I mean, that's just very difficult to guard against, isn't it? You need just a huge, um, uh, huge contribution of, of uh, air defense systems. And, and it is going to be effective well, if it destroys civilian infrastructure targets, isn't it? And if I could just interrupt to go back to my previous statement, it is far more costly and it is harder to defend against them once they're airborne. The better way to defend against these type of systems is to kill them on the ground, kill their command and control systems on the ground, kill the soldiers that fly them on the ground before they're airborne. That takes us back to we need to give Ukraine the ability to take these systems out before they get airborne. For a while, we had Iranians in Crimea training uh, uh, Ukrainian or uh, training Russians. They may still be there. I don't know. I do not have specific intelligence, but we know they were there for a while. We should have took them out while they're in Crimea, and we don't. We haven't given uh, 
um, Ukraine the capability to do that yet. And this is just an incredible example of how important giving Ukraine these long range, precise strike capabilities far cheaper to kill it on the ground than defend against it once it's airborne. Very interesting uh, point. And if I can just draw you uh, on another subject uh, of much chatter uh, this week, uh, whether China is gearing up to invade Taiwan, if you look into your crystal ball for 2023, do you think that that could be on the cards for this year or do you think we're still some way out from a potential conflict? Well, I, I think it was the great philosopher Yogi Berra that used to talk about how hard it was to predict the future. So let me not predict the future, but let me say the following. The way that the West and primarily the United States left Afghanistan and the way that we are conducting ourselves in this war, creating sanctuary for Russia, allowing Russia all of these uh, uh, ways of making life miserable for Ukraine without uh, direct response. I think that the Iran's, the North Korea's, and the China's of the world are taking notice. Uh, specifically in China's case, China looks at uh, the way the West has dealt with Russia when threatened with nukes. In 2008, Russia invaded Georgia, and when the West started gearing up to respond, uh, in the terms of an American fairy tale, Russia huffed and puffed and threatened to blow our house down, and we and we capitulated and allowed Russia to retain 20% of Georgia. In 2014, Russia invaded Ukraine twice, first in uh, Crimea, second in the Donbass, and Russia huffed and puffed and threatened to blow our house down, and we capitulated and allowed them to retain Crimea and a, a chunk of the Donbass. And I think that now Russia is counting on us doing the same thing in 22. And the rest of the world now has seen that if you threaten the West, and specifically if you threaten the United States with nuclear war, they will stand down. And I think this is something that our military and civilian leaders are going to have to address in the future. How do we break this cycle of stepping back when we're threatened with tactical nuclear exchange. Well, that's a, a grave note on, on which to end and something we'll need to uh, discuss uh, in, in further months if you will come and join us again. General Philip Breedlove, we've been uh, grateful for your time today. My thanks also to producer Louis Sykes. You've been listening or watching The Frontline with Lucy Fisher on Times Radio.